Hey, everybody, before we get into this week's show, I want to let you know that the Unexplained Occurrences Tour has expanded to two more seats available. So if you are somebody who wanted to go on the tour that we are doing, the exclusive tour, if you don't know about it, go to the website. We talked about it a few weeks ago, but go to the website and hit the Unexplained Occurrences Tour tab on the website, read about it. But if you want in on this action, this exclusive tour we're doing on June 25th through the 26th, Go ahead and reserve your seat today. Call Creed at Educated Wanderer. His phone number is 973-513-9001. Or you can email him at traveler at educatedwanderer.com. Go ahead and do that now if you're interested because those two seats are going to get taken up real fast. All right, let's get to this week's show. This was all circulating around the base that a giant had been killed, but no one was supposed to talk about it. I saw three long bony fingers reach up underneath the door, curl up to grab it, and then disappear. When he came over to me, dude, he slithered over to me. And this giant comes out of the cave and they're all frozen. And he starts running and firing at this giant. But the giant moves, he's got a spear in one hand and he's running really fast and spears Dan and holds him up like this. Somebody yells, shoot him in the face, shoot him in the face. They basically decapitate him. Got closer, got closer, got closer. When he got about 15 yards away from me, I raised that 12 gauge and I blow his head off. I feel something pulling at my leg and I look over and there are two small gray entities pulling at me. And they're literally, I'm getting pulled off the bed. I reached my hand into this bush and I touch air. Couldn't breathe and I couldn't move because I know I'm seeing a monster. Yep. Welcome to the show, everybody. You're listening to The Confessionals. I am your host, Tony Merkel. Thank you for being here. If you've had an encounter or a story you'd like to share with me on the show, go ahead and shoot me an email. My email address is theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. That's theconfessionals at theconfessionalspodcast.com. Or go to the website, theconfessionalspodcast.com. Hit the contact section and you can reach me that way as well. Either way works for me, just get a hold of me. If you want more shows every week, we release a bonus show to the website for members only every Thursday. Thursday. So if you want to hear more of the show on a weekly basis, go to confessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button and become a member today. And if you want to be prepared for that emergency in your life that you just never know is coming, but you know it is going to come, go to preparewiththeconfessionals.com. That's preparewiththeconfessionals.com. And there you can get yourself emergency supplies and emergency food that will last up to 25 years on the shelf right there for you at preparewiththeconfessionals.com. Now, I also want to let you guys know we are uploading to YouTube now. We're going to upload the entire archive to YouTube. It's going to take probably about five to six months of releasing one video a day to YouTube. And so if you want to go ahead and listen to the old shows on YouTube, they will be premiering. So there will be a live chat with people there, including myself. So go to YouTube, look for the confessionals and hit subscribe. We greatly appreciate it. The more the channel grows, the more I'm going to do with it. And I'm planning on some pretty awesome videos for you guys coming down the pike that you're not going to miss out. So go ahead and subscribe to YouTube. Hit that stupid alarm bell so you get notified when I upload. Also, we have a Discord now. Many of you have asked me to have a Discord for years, and I just didn't know what Discord was and how to use it, so I never did it. And I still don't really know how to use it, but we do have a Discord now, and the link is in the description below that you can hit and go ahead and join the Discord and join the conversation 24-7, all things confessionals. Now, this week, we have my Uncle Mark coming on the show, and he came up from D.C. to record with me in studio, in person. He was in the Navy for over 20 years, and and he was actually first stationed on the USS Forrestal, which is a haunted ship. It's no longer active, but back in the 60s, there was a tragic fire that actually led to over 160 people dying, and that ship has legends of hauntings. And he comes to talk about that, plus some of the other things that he and his family went through in a home that was haunted in Massachusetts. So let's get to my Uncle Mark in this great conversation right now. All right. Well,
welcome to the show, everybody. We got my uncle Mark in studio. How are you, sir? I'm doing good. I long drive from DC up to here, but it was a, it's a great day to do it. Yeah, I had uh, Uncle Pally in the studio for Hammerlane Legends. We were talking, <laughs> uh, dry, you know, Dunbar stories and things like that, and uh, it was the three of us down here, and that was fun too. But uh, you know. Uncle Mark, we're going to be talking to the people today about uh, the USS Forrestal and mm -hmm. the <clears throat> excuse me the hauntings that it has and why it's haunted. Uh, we're also going to talk about your personal experiences living in a house with uh, Andrew Jean and the kids. Um, but I want to start off with giving you the opportunity to talk to people about uh, you're you're an author and you have a ser a book series and go ahead and tell people what it's all about. Well, I'm I'm a fantasy author. I've been writing for about 20 years now. Um, just published my third book. It's uh, called The Outlander War. It's the third book of the Forever Avalon series. Uh, my series basically takes a look at the King Arthur Arthurian legends and does a what happened next approach after Arthur's death, you know? So I bring a modern family to the island of Avalon where all magic now exists and uh, tell their, the story of what's going on there through that, through that family's interaction uh, in this uh, medieval fantasy world. And the third book actually is where the island reappears in the real world and comes into conflict with the U.S. Navy. So I was able to bring some of my Navy experience into the into that book, yeah. And and how the two worlds of modern military and medieval magic crossover, clash, and uh, come to bear against each other. And so I've got those three books are my current books out. I'm actually trying to get two more books published this year. Uh, the fourth book in the Forever Avalon series, it's called The Prometheus Engine. I'm hoping to have that out this year. And then I started writing a new series, uh, new kind of a, I, I think of it as a futuristic fantasy dystopian world. It's called The Last Magus. Mm. And so that's a new one I'm working on coming out. And I also have um, where my work in project is... Uh, kind of a steampunk historical fiction uh called it's called corsair and the sky pirates so i'm trying to my my trying to cross over a little bit more into the sci-fi era with yeah. that but it's just i it's part of who i am as a writer i just love the sci-fi fantasy genre so being able to express myself through my writing is great so uh you said the magic word to me dystopian yeah. <laughs> so uh i i listen i'm not a big movie buff and i'm not really uh into you know Hollywood and stuff as mm -hmm. far as TV shows go. But if I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, it's going to be some kind of dystopian flick because, you know, people who listen to the show, they know like my mind goes there. I think we're heading towards a dystopic future. Yeah. And uh, do you kind of go into like, uh, like how deep into the dystopian idea do you go into with that book? Well, the idea behind it is kind of if, if you've ever read uh, Terry Brooks, uh, The Sword of Shannara. Okay. Chronicles. Um, his book was basically if, that, that series is was set in the American Northwest in a future that where the world has become one of magic and everything. So I kind of got inspiration from that. And I had a singular event that caused the explosion of magic in the near future then and creates this this world, this new world of magic. It's I'm kind of Again, going a sort of a steampunk theme, but it, with more of the magic side because um, it's where machines and everything operate by magic, okay, and everything. So I'm kind of crossing in that path. Um, some of the places will seem familiar, but I've given them new names because of where you know where it, it's thousands of years into the future, things have changed. Yeah, in that respect. But I'm just I wanted to base something but make it different and unique in that respect. So that's where I came up with the idea for this. It's like, uh, it's it, well, I mean, machines operating off magic, it's almost like alchemy combining science and magic. And Absolutely. And, that, and that's, uh, that's one of the things I love when you get that kind of a crossover of magic and science or fantasy and science fiction, you get that cross, you can do something like that. That's what's great about the genre is that the sky's the limit. You know, I can try to explain things through my, ideas and and how things are done but at the same time is i can go any route i want to that's one of the great things about being a fantasy writer yeah yeah you how long have you been writing for fantasy well i've been because i know i know you started after you retired like at least as far as like the whole as a serious writer a serious, i started yeah. i started after i retired but i've actually been doing stuff like this since the 70s since i was a kid really i mean when i when i was growing up uh, i 
collected comic books and I wanted to be the next Stan Lee and the next Jack Kirby. So I was creating my own characters, storylines. I even started drawing and I, w- I wanted to go that route. But unfortunately, I'm my art, what didn't pan out as well as I liked. So mm-hmm. I focused on the writing more so and everything. So I've developed my writing through there. And then, of course, when I joined the Navy, I became a, a Navy journalist. So my right, even though my writing was more focused on news releases, feature stories, things like that about the different commands and things I was stationed at places I was stationed at and the places I went to, um, it was still, you know, that still helped develop my skills as a writer. And then I started writing this story, uh, in, 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 during my last deployment in 2001. Um, so that's where the story started developing. And then I, by the time I finished it and then started, it didn't get published till 2009. So it took a while after that, but yeah, it, I did start writing this during, you know, want, during my time when I was active duty. That's cool. That's cool. And talking about active duty, I mean, you retired. Uh, how, how long were you in the Navy? 23 years. 23 years. 23 years. I, I, I joined in um, 1983, retired in 2006. And now you work for the FBI. No. <laughs> no I, that's all right. The no, CIA. Uh, HUD. <laughs> Department of Housing and Urban Development. So uh, it's, it's a lot different aspect as a writer editor, you know, do, yeah. doing that. But um, it's actually, I found it a lot more fulfilling in my job because the fact of that, you know, the people I work with our our goal is helping people who less fortunate get housing and be able to have a roof over their heads. And, and I found, you know, that job crosses all political boundaries and what have you. So it, I would, I would have been able to, you know, really get into this uh, job as uh, doing, you know, it, it, it just a basic thing of taking a complex <laughs> rule and regulation and trying to make it where it's more legible for the everyday person to read and understand that's that's in a nutshell it's what i do yeah but it's just be the rewarding part of it of that knowing that the work i'm doing is helping these you know less fortunate families that that really is it's uh, beneficial to me is my own self yeah worth more or less we were talking about that before we started recording and stuff about giving and and giving of yourself and it's just like you don't understand what that does for you on a personal level till you start doing it. And Absolutely. the more, it's just like, I always think about the, the, uh, I don't know if you've ever really got into that TV show friends back in the day. Yeah. A little bit. Um, Lindsay watches it all the time. Still <laughs> that and the office are her two go-tos for comfort shows. And, um, there's, there's this one, uh, episode where Phoebe, is saying that uh you know she loves giving this that and the other and joey's like there is no selfless good deed and she's like no there are good selfless de- or good selfless good deeds and um they spend the whole episode focusing on you know phoebe doing these good deeds and then he's pointing out why it's 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 not selfless and uh but the the idea and the feeling behind actually giving back to whether it's a community individuals if you can do such things mm-hmm. It's so rewarding on a on an individual le- level where you, you grow so much Absolutely. personally. And like I said, it, it, you know, I've been with the Navy f- I, as both an active duty and a civilian for over thirty years. And you know, when I transitioned from the Navy, uh, going to work for HUD, even though it's same, it's still a government job. But the time is just, you know, I thought that there was, I was stepping into a lot of bureaucracy and you mm-hmm. don't, it, it, it is, you mean it, yes, it's there, not going to lie. It's there. But again, the, the people who are there, their, their main focus and concern is just helping people with housing and making it easier to get people into housing. And that's, that's a, a big part of it. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So where can people get your book? Well, my books are readily available on Amazon, but they can also find me at authormarkpiggott.wordpress.com. Uh, I do my own blog where I talk about everything from writing um, advice to everything geek, because that's what I'm into. So I, you know, I nice. talk about a little bit of everything week to week and just, and also about my books, but they're all, it's all there. So you can find me there and there'll be link. There's links there to, to buy my books as well. I've had, I've had authors on the show before and, you know, I, I don't know my audience as well. Sometimes I think I know my audience. Yeah. Uh, and I had uh, a, one guy on the show, Charlie Robinson, he's written a few books uh, one of them is right here, the octopus of global control, mm. my kind of st- style. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, he, he said that when he came on the show, he said, you know, his book sales went 
up a lot. And so apparently my audience are readers. So well, I, 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 I'm welcoming anybody. And just to, if I can do a one selfless plug is uh, on Saturday, June the 5th, I will be at the Moravian Bookstore in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, doing a book signing from one to three. So uh, you, awesome. everybody's welcome to come out and I'd be happy to meet them and sign a copy of the book for them. Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. And you're coming up from DC to do that, huh? Yeah, well, you know, it was one of those things of when it, uh, I've always come up uh, and done th- stuff. I'm, since I'm originally from Phillipsburg, New Jersey, though, you know, so I'm part of the Lehigh Valley more or less. So, yeah. you know, I always come up and, and do stuff up here uh, since family's all around here. Yeah. Um, I, I've, go to, I've donated books to my high school and spoken uh, to the high school kids about being a writer. That's and awesome. about my Navy career as well. And so, you know, I, I, I always try to do that and, and talk and inspire future writers yeah. in that sense. Yeah. One of my, one of my inside dreams is to be asked to come back to my high school and, and speak to the students about being <laughs> well, you never a successful know. Hey, entrepreneur. Hey, so. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the dream and it's, it's a great thing to do. Yeah. So, uh, that's awesome. And I highly encourage people to check it out and stuff as far as your books go. Forever Avalon is a book series you've been working on for a long time. Yep. Uh, so let's talk about, let's switch some gears and talk about uh, some ghosts. And now, are you the kind of guy that kind of gives weight into these things? Or was it like something that you had to, you know, see it to believe it kind of thing when it came to like these, these uh, ship stories? I, I know, like, I don't think you were ever stationed in the Forestall, right? USS? No, I know I was. You that, were? That was my, the Forestall was my first ship. I was stationed, I was stationed there from 1984 to 1989. And that's where I found out about these stories gotcha. and everything, because to understand it, you have to first go back in time to July 29th, 1969. Uh, that's when the Forsall was at, off the Gulf of Tonkin during the Vietnam War. And they were about to launch a strike, set a series of strikes. And they had there was a misfire of a, on one plane that misfired a rocket. That rocket went into another plane. And these planes were loaded with fuel and bombs. Yeah. And that caused a chain reaction explosion that rocked the entire flight deck. It, the flight deck became flooded with burning fuel. Bombs dropped from the planes onto this burnt de- burning deck. And then you just had one explosion after the other. And the ship was very, very much it, a, had a chance of, of sinking. There was a good chance that ship was not going to make it back. But it was because of the, the fortitude of the crew that they were able to get the fire under control and save the ship. Unfortunately, you had uh, 166 crew members lost their life mm. uh, at that day. And so after that incident happened, the ship then limped back to first to the Philippines to do what repairs they needed to. And then they made the journey back to Norfolk where the ship was home port at the time and everything. But when they got to the Phil from, from Vietnam to the Philippines, the crew members who had perished, their bodies had to be stored in the only place they could be stored, which was the refrigerated units that where we, where they kept food. So those became a makeshift morgue. And that's where most of these ghost stories that have been told to me, uh, take take place. It's all within that area. That's where they see things and hear. Have heard things have happened. Um, be- and and I got this firsthand because the fact of that the sailors who served in uh, and survived that fire, when they if they stayed in the navy, when they came back to a ship, they only came back to the forestall. Okay. I, I met dozens of sailors who basically every time they came, when they had sea duty assigned to them. Uh-huh. You know, you wrote is just give a general idea for those who might not know in the Navy, you rotate between shore duty and sea duty. And so when you would rotate back to sea duty, you would get assigned to a ship or, or to a squadron, something that's deployable. And so these sailors always came back to the forestall the, because of that, that fire just, did something to them into their psyche, into their mind that they could only, we would only serve at sea on board this ship, probably a survival. Hmm. I would say a, a good survival instinct on their behalf wow. um, and everything. So they always came back to the forestall and it's through them that I heard all of these stories about um, one incident. I can tell is that uh, one guy was down in the, uh, let me back up a bit, just a bit of a sec to lay out to understand. 
refriger uh, the the storage for food and cargo and things like that basically is in the lower decks, probably about six decks down from the main deck. If you think, if you look at an aircraft carrier, the hangar deck, that's the main deck. Um, that's the lower deck. The flight deck, of course, is about four stories up from that. So the hangar deck is the main deck. Then you go six more decks down. That's where the cargo areas are. And to get to those cargo areas, you have a shaft that's about, oh, four by four. That is just uh, just a long, thin shaft down with a hatch in between each one. They would stretch a cargo net between each part of the hatch. Sailors would sit in that cargo net and pass cargo down from from one deck down to the next, down the next, until it got down to those lower decks. So we'd be passing stuff down all the time. And so you'd have to go down there to get stuff, get passed back up, of course, for, for when you needed stuff for food. Yeah. So down those lower decks are the refrigerated areas. Uh, you, you have to get, the only way to get down there is through that access hatch. So there's no, you get down there and you start walking around. There's, you know, you, in one deck down there, there could be about three or four different refrigerator units, just, or dry storage cargo areas, just all in one area. So one story was told to me was a sailor went down there. He was doing, getting some things, looking some things, and he saw somebody out of the corner of his eye walk by and go into a refrigerator area. And it's like, he waited and waited, was kept doing his work, and that guy never came out. I was like, guy, he's, he's gonna be cold in there. What's he doing? So he goes in there, looks for the person, nobody there. Nobody there. And there's no other way out. They had to come out, go past him to come out. Nobody came out. Another story heard is that, you know, down these decks, we use sound powered phones. These are these are audio phones that basically your own sound of your voice is what powers them and sends this the signal through from one phone to the other. Hmm. We use these communicating between the upper deck saying, okay, ready, pass it down, and down to the lower decks about when they're ready to start passing stuff down. So phone rings, guy picks it up saying, help, and he hears screaming, help, help. They yell down the, the, the shaft saying, hey, what's going on down there? What are you talking about? Nothing's going on. Oh my gosh! You know, these are some of the stories that w- that I've heard from sailors on you know on the forestall about this and everything. I mean this this story you know this was something. It was offhand at first, and then we actually started getting newspapers inquiring about this. this even the national this, a story on this appeared in the National Enquirer about wow. the ghosts of the forestall and everything. So this is something that has made big news, and I have to say. When you, you need you look at uh, other ships from the from World War II and era where there has been death, uh, death or or something like that on board, you'll find ghost stories. The Intrepid up in New York, uh, the battleship New Jersey, which is here in which is over in New, in New Jersey itself, um, the USS Yorktown, the aircraft carrier, it's down in North Carolina. There have been reported ghost sightings, even to, because those are now museums. Yes. So even to this day, they they're people who are on there. Uh, who are watches or on their late? They still say they there are sounds and things that they can be heard. I, I you really have to think about the fact that how some of these sailors died. Yeah, um, especially on the forestall because the one thing you have to understand is the explosions and everything, and the fire was first started on the flight deck. But when those explosions went off, it ripped through the flight deck down into the deck below. Now on an aircraft carrier, right below the flight deck are birthing areas. That's where sailors sleep, especially those who work on the flight deck or in a squadron. They sleep right below the flight deck. When those explosions went off, it killed a lot of sailors in their sleep. Wow. Wow. I mean, it, it's got to be, it, it's such a disaster. I mean, 166 sailors die during mm-hmm. that that one time. I, I was reading about it a little bit. And um, is it true that John McCain was the the, yep. the pilot like i mean he was he was on he was state he was in one of the squadrons that was on the forestall he was actually in a plane that was caught up in when the when those explosions started happening the fire started explaining he was in his plane ready for launch and uh, when you there's a video the video um i i think i sent you the link of that trial yeah. by fire that's a trial by fire was a training video that every sailor had to see when we for, when I first joined the Navy, because because that was that demonstrated that everybody needs to know uh, how to be a t- firefighting, and that's mm-hmm. it was actually because of the incident that happened on the forestall that we created firefighting uh, t- schools for every sailor to go through. Back then, only if you were part of the firefighting team for either the flight deck or the ship did you get firefighting training. Now every sailor gets it because this incident proved that. 
because the, the firefighting team, the flight deck firefighting team was wiped out on the, at that first explosion. When that first, when, the, when things started happening, they were the first ones heading out there. They were the first ones trying to put the fire out. And then when those bombs started going off, they were the first ones killed. Jeez. And one of the guys, uh, he, he's actually, um, at an inspiration for the main character in my, in my book series, uh, the flight deck firefighting chief, his name was Gerald Ferrier. Uh, the firefighting school in Norfolk is actually named after him. Okay. And he was awarded, um, the uh, I can't remember if it was the Medal of Honor or if it was the Bronze Star, but he was awarded for his gallantry because what he did was he saved John McCain's life. Really? He ran out there on the flight deck and he had what we call it's a PKP bottle. It's a chemical fire extinguisher for 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 fuel fires. Um, so he went out there and started spraying it down, trying to push the flames down so the pilots could get out of their aircraft and escape. And it was because of Chief Ferrier that John McCain survived. So he saved his life, and he even credits that. There, John That's McCain's book. He actually, I, I, I have a copy of his of John McCain's one book, and where he talks about the Forestall Fire, and and he basically credited Chief Ferrier for saving his life. That's incredible. Yeah, because I, I was I was really shocked to see his name come up there. Yeah. And uh, then the, in the article that I was reading, it said that just like a couple of weeks later, he actually, that's when he crashed and became a prisoner of war. Yeah. Cause they, I mean, because on, how unlucky can you be? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, that's just the fortune of war. And, and, yeah. and again, also of uh, the time and everything, because a lot of the pilots there, they, if they wanted to stay in the fight, they just transferred to another ship, to another squadron and they continued on. That's what he did. Yeah. And everything. So unreal. Yeah. Unreal. Uh, so when this fire broke out, all these guys are fighting the fire with, from the video you sent me, it seems like, uh, there were a lot of guys that really didn't know the exact procedures to, to follow. Yeah. That, that Cause like I said, they, we, we, back then sailors were not trained in firefighting unless you were on a firefighting team. Yeah. Like I said, now that, that changed from this one of the, one story, uh, that, um, cause I, being a Navy journalist, you know, every year on the anniversary of the fire, I wrote a story about about this because we got new people rotating into the ship. And one of the there was a one one of the officers. Um, he was actually a enlisted man back in Vietnam. He became an officer. Um, he told me a story about how there was this one kid. Um, uh, he would just he was sitting there with his hose, shaking, pouring water into this hole. And everything, and and they for the they could not get him to move or to let go of that because he said he just as long as he had that hose in his hand, the fire wasn't going to touch him, and so he just sat there and just kept pouring water into the hole. There was more flooding damage, uh, uh, honestly, than anything else uh, from this incident because, again, inexperience from the sailors who were not trained properly, but at the same time, I think a lot of it was that feeling of just survival is a, I've got this hose. I'm not going to let go of it. Mm-hmm. And this one is he's, he told the story that this kid just would ne- not let go of the hose. He just kept pouring water and just trying making, cause there was still smoke coming out. And so he just kept, has, I got to keep fighting this fire or else I'm going to die. Wow. Yeah. No wonder why the place is freaking haunted. I mean, even, <laughs> even guys who didn't die, just the, the emotional energy that went into that day is crazy. Um, now, I heard, uh, I think it was on one of the articles you sent me, I I was reading these different accounts and stuff. And one thing that kind of struck me is, and I don't know if it's the the entity George that they talk about, um, but like they, there's a couple of times where you see that something is, is acting, but in a very physical way where like the one, the one guy said that he saw something walk into through a door, but it opened the door to walk through it. And then there's another one where something grabbed the package when they're putting stuff down that chute that you're talking yeah. about. So, something grabbed the package. And it's just like, holy crap. Like that that's like not just seeing something, but it's actually touching and moving stuff. Well, George, yeah. George was the nickname that that basically anybody who worked in uh on the mess decks. And and I, you know, I did my turn down there. Every every sailor, when you're when you're a young seaman and you're 
get on ship board ship for the first time, you do what we call mess cranking, which is basically you go for six months, you're down in the me- in the mess hall and you're working helping cook the food serve the food you know Mm. you know cleaning up doing the dishes uh moving the cargo the the food stores around you're doing all of that and so i did my turn i was a part of that at one time and so anybody who worked on there they knew about george george was the name that they gave the ghost that was down there they just it it was probably could you know they i don't know if it was multiples ghosts or what have you but they just they always just said oh it's just george yeah and everything that's just referred to it but yeah the things opening things moving hearing footsteps uh things falling off of shelves that that was a constant thing down there and every people if they had to go i i was the one thing i was always told is if you've got to go down to the dry stores or the refrigerator don't go by yourself <laughs> <laughs> they always say go take somebody go down there with them that way you know there's two of you yeah because it gets a little freaky yeah i can imagine i can imagine i, I remember working uh, in a in a pretzel factory in Reading, PA, when I was in college, mm-hmm. and I was working a double shift, and they put me in the back, and this is an old old building, and they put me in the back, and I was making the dough, but I was the only one there, yeah, and it was just creepy back there, you know, and I can't imagine being out on a ship, you know, going down to those refrigerators, I wouldn't want to go alone either. Yeah, it's it. There, there's a lot of places. I, I mean, I, like I said I've I've been on four different aircraft carriers. Um, two of the older ones between the Forstall and my last ship was the Enterprise, which was you know they just retired after 50 years. So you know I've I've been on two of the older ships, and there are places and things you hear and see and hear throughout throughout that. Yeah, it's possible yeah. as many times it's happened you know I, this is a question i asked you years ago and i gotta tell the audience you're gonna be disappointed my uncle mark has never seen ufos out at sea <laughs> i even tried telling him i tried telling him it's okay you can talk about it now they're coming out and they're saying stuff but he said he's never seen anything which means he's seen stuff he's just not willing to talk about it <laughs> you, know, you know what though the, the 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 thing is you have to understand is that on an aircraft carrier you, it's going 24 7 um, especially when you're deployed and at night, when we're doing night flight operations, we switch our lights from, uh, to, a, a not a red, it's like an orangish color, but it's a night, it's night lights more or less is where you can go out there and you can, you can see things on the deck, but it's hard to see at a distance and, you know, and everything. So, yeah. so the, the, the ship is constantly lit. The only time I've ever been on the deck uh, it was actually I was on the forestall. Um, we had just we had just finished uh, a four year yard period. I, I got to the ship at the tail end of that. They did what they called a service life extension program at the Philadelphia Naval Shipyard down in Philly, and so I I was there for the last year of that, and then we um, started doing sea trials. So when you're going out for sea trials, you're, you're mainly worried about the ship. We had no aircraft on board. And everything. So one night, um, my first class, uh, Lenny Malloy, um, great guy. He uh, he said, "Here, I want to show you something." And he took he took me up to the flight deck, and after my and it was it was pitch black. You couldn't see anything, but we were in the middle of the ocean at, by that time. We were out in the Atlantic, and by the time my eyes adjusted and I looked up, I could see more stars than I could ever see in my lifetime because out there. There's nothing. There's no city lights. There's yeah. nothing. No, no, nothing to bother you. And you just saw, I just saw the veil of heaven, you know, from, from horizon to horizon. Mm-hmm. And it's one of the most beautiful things I will, I will ever see in my life seeing that. Yeah. That- it's incredible. You know, so that's the only time <sighs> you can't see things otherwise. I mean, I, you really, you just can't. Yeah. And everything. Cause the, the interference from the lights on the ship, it's just, it's, it prevents that. And that, that makes sense. I mean, we, I think, I mean, at least I do. I often, often think, you know, Hollywood version of, you know, air airships <laughs> or aircraft carriers. And so, you know, at nighttime, it's it's dark out at the sea and you can just look in the sky and see whatever's out there. But uh, it makes sense. I mean, it's almost like uh, if you're being, in, if you're in the middle of a parking lot the, yeah. at nighttime, the lights are on all the time and, you know, it's kind of hard to see right. past that, that but light. The, and that's, it's also a safety issue because you have sailors up there, even when, if we're not launching at that time, they're up there, they're, you have the squadron guys up there sometimes doing some maintenance last minute checks if we got launches the next day uh you got security just walking around up there making sure that people aren't wandering or 
doing things they're not supposed to be or be where they're not supposed to be up on the flight deck because mm. it, it, it's a safety issue. So, you know, it's one of those things of that. It was just always something going on up there. Security. I, I never really thought about these ships having security. Oh yeah. We have, yeah. Ships have a, have their own security force. Really? We have, we have yeah. We have our own police force on board. The, well, man, because you're going to, you're all on the same team. Right. But at the same time is when a fight breaks out, what's going to happen? Or, you know, things like yeah. that. And that does happen. That happens yeah. a lot. Or, and and I can say this now, you know, because it wasn't on my first ships, but on my last ship, because when I was on Enterprise, Enterprise was the first ship that we had women on board. Okay. And so uh, you had, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm going to say, but yet, you, especially when they're 18 to 21 year olds, yeah. men and women together and bored out of their minds when they're at sea. Nothing around. Things happen. Yeah. Oh, they're not sure. supposed to, but yeah. it happens, you know, and everything. So, you know, you, that's why you have a security force and everything. Yeah. So, so and again, so you also, come across it's two people romping and you're like, hey, break that up. You're not supposed to be doing that. <laughs> I, I, I never <laughs> caught, I, the, the, wor the worst I ever had is my, my office was right under the flight deck and you had to go through the, uh, arresting gear room, uh, one of them, um, uh, for the, uh, the barricade the barricade was basically if if a plane couldn't get its hook down to catch one of the wires the arresting gear wires you got to take it in the barricade if you want to see a barricade in action watch the movie the final countdown that's okay. the one with uh it's was made in the late 70s uh with uh martin sheen and kirk douglas it's about the uss nimitz going back in time right before the attack on pearl harbor it's a great, it's a, one of those, it's, that's one of those great Navy science fiction movies you got to watch, you know, to watch. But uh, on there, they had to rig the barricade. So the barricade's a net they stretch across at the plane, basically to catch the plane mm -hmm. if it couldn't land by itself or had issues like trouble with its landing gear or in this case, its hook. But anyway, so I'm, I'm going through the, the barricade room to my office. And as I'm walking through some of the, the guys who work in the, you know, men and women who work on the, in the resting gear, they're there. And you had this one female sa sailor sitting on the lap of a male sailor. Hmm. And I immediately stopped and said, you need to get up right now. I don't want to see this again out here, or I'm going to be talking to your chief. And they were like, <laughs> yes, chief. And so they, they stopped and everything, but you know, that's, that's as far as I got, you know, in, in those kind of instances, but it does happen. It, yeah. you can't, it's, you know, men and women, it's like I said, 18 to 21. Yeah. You're not going to stop it. No, no. Especially th these things are huge. I mean, I, I don't think people totally understand how big these ships are. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, a floating airport. Yeah. It's hard to think about it. I, but again, uh, the, the thing with the, on the flight deck security on the flight deck, it's primarily a safety issue because you cannot be walking around out there where, you know, in an instant, you don't know where you're stepping and then you're going to walk and then fall right overboard. Yeah. And you are three stories up. That's like falling off a three story building building and hitting that water. It's hitting concrete. Mm -hmm. That's what it feels like. That's what I've been told by people. I mean, I've had, we've had guys who are flown, blown off. Uh, they are on the flight deck and an aircraft turns the wrong way. The jet wash blew, bl blows them right off the flight deck and they Jeez. hit that water. And that what you, hits you with such an impact, and we we lost a guy one time like that from the impact. From just well, he hit the water, and then so we had a man overboard. We circled, we we couldn't find him really because he got because that wow. impact just hits you that can hit you that hard. Wow, that's crazy. Like I I just don't. I guess I think about our military and our navy, and I'm like, no, nah, we're not losing any men at sea by accidents. I mean, you know, this isn't Christopher Columbus days. It happens all the time. Wow, it, it does. It, you, you, either by accident or things just happen jeez so i i uh when i the i used to drive down the philadelphia uh shipyard a lot mm -hmm. and so i'm in a tractor trailer you know driving around down there and uh you don't realize how big these things are till you're in a tractor trailer and you feel like an ant mm -hmm. like I, I and these and these the ships that i was driving by weren't aircraft carriers you know and i i'm assuming aircraft carriers are even bigger yes it's just like the, i think the ones crap. down in philly those that's part of the what they what we call the ghost fleet that's for a name appropriate name but yeah. those are decommissioned ships who are basically waiting for di disposition of what's going to happen to them and everything so they're just sitting down there for storage more or less i got you yeah. i i i used most to of those my... are cruisers i think i think most of them i want to... what, what's a cruiser like what, what... Cru well if you got the 
for for ships smallest ship that we have at, on is uh, you go frigate destroyer cruiser battleship aircraft okay. carrier gotcha so it's kind yeah. of in the middle in the middle yeah okay so i mean shoot if that if that's in the middle i can't imagine <laughs> being near an aircraft carrier that's crazy um because I would take my lunch break sometimes right on the port where, I mean, I'm literally just looking straight up at this ship and I'm thinking, these things are huge, you know? All right, let's take a second to talk about this week's sponsor, which is HelloFresh. Now, HelloFresh is partnered with Green Chef. If you remember a few weeks back, we did a Green Chef commercial. Well, guess what? HelloFresh, Green Chef, they're one and the same. So all you people who ordered Green Chef before, you're going to love this as well. HelloFresh is legit. They're America's number one meal kit company. HelloFresh will measure ingredients and send them right to your door pre-done. All you got to do is take 30 minutes to make your dinner and it's set good to go. HelloFresh cuts out the stressful planning of grocery st- Listen, grocery stores are a pain in the butt. I don't know anybody who enjoys going grocery shopping. Maybe there's some of you out there, but I absolutely 100% hate it. And HelloFresh is a great substitute because all that stuff comes right to your door in the preset meal kits. All you have to do is spend 30 minutes or less to cook it up and enjoy it. Now, HelloFresh has 25 recipes to choose from every freaking week. You're not going to be short on any options when it comes to HelloFresh and a healthier lifestyle. If that's for you, it is for me. I recently lost 20 pounds so far and I'm really feeling good. And I actually want to make sure I keep that weight off. And HelloFresh keeps those things in mind when it comes to their meal planning with low calorie, carb smart, and even vegetarian options. And on top of that, a dining survey says that HelloFresh is 28% cheaper than shopping at your local grocery store and 72% cheaper than a restaurant meal without sacrificing any of that quality that you think you're going to have to sacrifice because you want to go to the restaurant, get that good meal prep. Well, it's all done for you through HelloFresh. Now, this is the best part of this ad, friends. I'm telling you, go to HelloFresh.com slash 12Tony and use the promo code 12Tony for 12 free meals, including free shipping. Let me tell you that again. 12 free meals when you go to hellofresh.com slash 12 Tony. That's a freaking amazing deal. I don't know why you wouldn't take advantage of that. So go to hellofresh.com slash 12 Tony right now and use the promo code 12 Tony for 12 free meals, including the free shipping. Go now. All right. So, have you ever heard of the Philadelphia experiment? Yes. Oh, yeah. What Absolutely. Do you, what do you think about it? Because I think I, I, I do. I believe it happened. Absolutely. I think. Awesome. I think that they were testing. You, you have to understand at that time in World War II, especially, we were testing everything we could. They were trying different different experimentations on on things, and blocking radar was a big big issue. Um, trying to help save lives. So do I believe? Yeah, I absolutely believe the Philadelphia experiment happened. Not like the movie they did in the eighties. <laughs> come on now. Oh, come on. I want time, that. I want that yeah, one. The, time, the, the, the linking and the time travel. <laughs> That's what that, I want. That, I know that would be cool. That would be cool. But I do think I, I, I've I've read the stories of the sailors who were on board um, and uh, what happened to them. Uh, yeah. The Eldridge, I believe, was the ship. Um, the USS Eldridge, and and I and hearing and seeing what what happened to them, um, who knows what they they tapped into when they when they were experimenting like that. I mean, you have to think when you think about every kind of military experimentation through the years. I mean, yeah. you, you know, you, you testing always, the nukes, yeah, you know? <laughs> that holy. Crap. I mean, e- even you know something. I, I my last uh, command I served with was the submarine force, and so I and I found out that. Uh, about the USS Alligator, which you probably never even no. heard of. USS Alligator was actually a first submarine before the Hunley, before the Confederates tested the Hunley. We, the Union had the Alligator and it was tested off of Philadelphia. And they think it sunk somewhere and it sunk and they think it's still somewhere there off Philadelphia. Really? And never, yeah. And I never heard about it before until, until the, until I served with some people who were actually on a project trying to find and salvage the alligator. Wow. So somewhere off of, off of Philadelphia in, in the Delaware river somewhere, there is a hull of a union submarine. Wow. 
Have you ever been on a submarine? Oh, yes. Yeah? Oh, yeah. I've been, I, I, again, part of my job, I did public affairs for the Navy. So part of my job was escorting people out on uh, media and, and such out on, on different ships. And being, I was with the submarine force, I was the one who took them out on the submarines gotcha. and out there. So I've been on a fast attack. Uh, I was actually took Terry Bradshaw on the USS Pittsburgh. Really? Uh, for an overnight submarine. We went out, dove down. Come, came back the next day and everything, but it was that was fun. And I've been on I've been on the ballistic, the big ones, the ballistic missile submarines. That's I'm more comfortable on that because those are like big for you have a lot of room <laughs> compared to a fast attack as tight quarters as that I is. Imagine. No, on, on the on the big ballistic missile submarines, I was able to walk around without any issues. Yeah. And how tall are you? You're like six four. Yeah. So I mean you're <laughs> you're a little bit tall there. Yeah. Uh now since you have experience with submarines and obviously being out at ocean and stuff, we, mm -hmm. we talk about sometimes, you know, uh, how mysterious the oceans are because they're, they're so unexplored. And I've, I've heard that 95% of the oceans are unexplored. As absolutely. Far as, is that something that's absolutely feasible to you? Absolutely. Because you, we can't go to some of the depths that is out there. I mean, the Marianas Trench, just for an example, you think about how many, I, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but that's miles and miles deep. We can't even get down the pressure down, going down that deep is too great. Hmm. I mean, just for these guys that go up to the Titanic um, sunken yeah. ship and everything, uh, going up there, they th those are, it's so limited as how deep they can go and how long they can stay down. I mean, it, it's there is so much unexplored of the ocean that we haven't even gotten near enough and don't have that capability yet. It's just a technology factor that we don't have the technology absolutely. to do it. Oh, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, when you think about it, we just can't go that I deep. Can't, I, I have a hard time wrapping my head around that. I mean, we shoot we shoot ourselves into space. We're talking about going to Mars and we can't figure out our own oceans. Well, it's uh, it's it's more of a thing of pressure. It's like I said, it's not, it's not about where in space is an absence of pressure down in the ocean. You have too much pressure that mm. you, it just crushes, crushes you like a beer can. Yeah. It's just, you can't do it. Um, and we're, I, I, th I know we're working on it. I know they're trying to, to do develop more and more for that because I, even I think that, you know, we need to be doing more with the ocean and everything. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you do. <laughs> you spend your whole life on it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so with the ocean, do you think that there could be like, let's just call it generically sea monsters where there's just, they, there are creatures down there we've never laid eyes on there and absolutely huge because, you know, they live at the deepest of depths. Is that yeah, is that no, a possibility, I, you think? I mean, you look at some of the giant squids that they're finding yeah. and everything, though that's just that's just one creature. You don't know what else could be down there. I mean, it, it is... Mm -hmm. As unexplored as it is, you can't because they're they're used to that depth. They're not used to art the sunlight, so they stay down there and trying just to coax them out. And again, I, I being a fantasy writer as I am, you know these are the stories that have been passed on from the early days, from the first sailors, yeah, and everything. I mean, that's where where all you know when you think about everything from the Bermuda Triangle to you know the the depths of the ocean and what's down there there's we don't know we haven't done it yet we haven't been there and been part of that and what, everything what are your thoughts on the bermuda triangle okay uh well uh, no i believe something's happened i believe something but i also tied that into my book because in my book series forever avalon i said that the only way to access avalon was going through the bermuda triangle mm. because it was we the the barrier that kept avalon separate from the outside world was weakened by storms and so everything that disappeared in the bermuda triangle ended up on avalon that's where outlanders people from the outside world came you know they lived there i mean one one of the characters was actually uh, in within my book was Lieutenant Charles Taylor. He was the one that led that squadron, Navy squadron that flew out over the Bermuda Triangle and disappeared. He was actually a character in my book, you know. So yeah. I I'm a firm believer in in that because I think there is something weird out there. You you can't just have these aircraft and ships, so many of them that just Gone. disappeared and not know what happened to them. Again, yeah. it's just it's one of those great mysteries that we're still we still have, don't have answers to. I, I, and that's the thing. I mean. You hear about, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I've I've heard stories of you know, say a ship or a plane goes missing and then it shows up like seventy years later, like like almost like a time slip or something. Yeah. That's trippy stuff to me. That's really trippy stuff because um, we have uh, 
I always forget his name. I think his name is Edward Manez. He's a, a like a nuclear physicist or something like that. And and he's been on record and he says that it, our science does dabble in parallel universes. Yeah. Like like I'm thinking to myself, hold on a second. Like <laughs> this is no longer the 1990s Tony's a little kid anymore thinking that, you know, wouldn't it be cool. Now we have mainstream scientists coming out talking about how yes, we dabble in parallel universes. So you're telling me there's a parallel universe then. <laughs> it's like, yes. And I'm just like, holy crap, man. Like what are the possibilities? Well, I mean, I mean, to me it's a thing of that when you think about the progression of science. I mean, you look at how many, you know, it, it took us how many decades just to go from a uh, gas powered stove to the electrical microwave that we have, yeah. the gap in that. But at the same time, we've gone from a computer that took the man to the moon to one you can hold that that's 10 times as powerful that you can hold in the palm of your hand mm -hmm. and in a shorter amount of time. So I think we're progressing faster when it comes to technology. And so I think the, these ideas, you know, are becoming more of a reality. I mean, it's like I said, you know, you thought about the theory of relativity. Nobody thinks about that yet. We're progressing towards that actually being possible in, in, in the ideas of space travel and, and such, yeah. you know, uh, you, you're starting the things that were science fiction of Star Trek were are now becoming reality. Mm -hmm. So we're I think we're crossing that platform that that uh, generational gap, and I think it's becoming more and more reality. So people are starting to think more that way. Yeah, I've definitely noticed towards that. the possibility yeah. of that of that being uh, uh, out there. Yeah, it's it's crazy, man. It, it like I I'm fascinated by the mysterious. Uh, universe that we live in this world mm -hmm. i mean there's so many mysteries and you know kind of backtracking a little bit to the oceans and stuff um you know there's a lot of people out there that and it sounds to me like you probably don't really get into a whole lot of ufology but there's a lot of people out there that believe that um uaps or you know ufos uh might submerge some them, submerge themselves underwater and that's how they remain undetected and i to be honest with you i have photographs uh that was sent to me a guy this is when i first started the show he is from canada he lives off of a bay and there's a storm coming through and the he was taking video of this storm and the lightning coming down and afterwards he was going through it trying to get a still frame of just the lightning striking the water and he noticed that in like the same frame as the lightning there was this thing shooting out of the water and he caught it three different times in a very short period like maybe like a second you know and you see it like it, it's coming out of the water then it's it's halfway through the sky then it's up it, leaving the frame yeah but it, it looked like a, a thin flat disc shooting out of the water and it's just like the idea that man if there were crafts uh you know these whether they're extraterrestrial or you know by our own government the freaking Ocean would be a great spot to hide it if we had the technology from getting it crushed like a can, like you said. Yeah, but again, I, 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 we're thinking on the the lines of technology let that of that type that exists. It may not exist for us, but who knows who it exists for mm -hmm. and everything. I mean, it's it's the same concept when you think about we we are trying to understand what life is at. How can a, a crab, you know, that's this big survive at the bottom of the ocean yet we can't you know and yeah. things like that the same thing goes if you think about um what was it uh europa mm -hmm. and everything you know they know that that planet is 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 water underneath all that ice they're down deep enough could there be life absolutely there could be some kind of life down there we don't know yeah. Until we get there, we can't, you can't, until you get there and see it and be and experience it for yourself. I, I don't think we're ever going to ever get past the skeptics. Yeah, I know. I know. But um, it, I, I think that there are, we have technologies that the, our, our military government has that we just don't have for civilians. I mean, it, it, yeah. it's, it, it just only makes sense. I mean, I talked to this one guy, I was doing a delivery. He owns a, ca a casket place. I mean, he, he sells caskets and I'm talking to him and he said back in the 60s, he was an engineer and he was working on, you know, like technology that he said they're coming out with today. Back then, he said that even down to the night vision and stuff like that. Um, so 
I, I just think that, you know, shoot, man, maybe it, it's it's our own our own government and they have technology we're just not aware of because they don't want to talk about it. Well, I mean, if it. you think about it, the the in the, within the Navy right now, we're they're, we're testing the rail gun, rail guns. Mm-hmm. And that to me, that rail gun was something Tell that people what rail guns are in case. Rail you don't gun is uses uses electromagnetic uh energy to propel a shell at supersonic speed. So you're yeah. you're 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 shooting a shell, but instead of uh, shooting it with uh, gunpowder and an explosion behind it, you're using electromagnetic energy to propel it, and it propels it faster, more lethal, mm, and very. over a greater and over a greater distance. And again, back in the '80s, this was science fiction to me. Yeah, this was something I used to do a lot of role playing games in when I was a teenager in the '70s and '80s. And you know, one of the space games I used to play was called Space Opera, I believe it was the name of it. And one of the weapons I had was. A, uh, was a was a rail gun that I could carry and shoot and everything uh, when I was going out and you know playing the game and such. Yeah. And then just recently, the Navy started has been testing over at Dahlgren, which is uh, the weapons testing facility. It's in Maryland, I believe. I want to say it's on the on the eastern shore of Maryland. But they're testing real the rail gun out there. That could be you could see that on our ships in the next few years and everything. That's incredible. And I mean, we're already using that. The new aircraft carrier, the USS Gerald Ford, the new class of carriers, they have electromagnetic uh, launchers for the air. No longer steam. It used to be steam powered. Nope, they're hmm. using electromagnetism to launch aircraft and to recover aircraft. So that technology is being used already on our ships, on the new mm-hmm. class of aircraft carrier. They're doing away with steam and hydraulics and converting everything to electromagnetism. It's funny because you bring up the science fiction nature where back in the 80s, a lot of this stuff was science fiction. Uh, and you talk about the railgun and the technology behind it. Uh, now... We dive, I dive into deep underground military bases. Mm-hmm. Fascinates me. Yeah. I know they exist. And it's not even a secret. Like, I mean, like Raven Rock is here in Pennsylvania. You can look at it on Google Maps. It, it's a military base, and the only opening is going into the ground. It, like, you can see it. <laughs> um, but I'll have to look at that one. I, yeah, I'll show, yeah, I'll show you when we're done. Yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting. And I mean, there's, they, there's, they have t shirts, Raven Rock. You know, it's, it's, it, it, I could go there right now as far as, well, the area, you can't really get too close because it's, you know, mm-hmm. a problem. But um, so there's there's people that say that, you know, they, they were involved in, you know, secret space programs, this, that, and the other. And they they talk about traveling from underground military base to underground underground military base underground. But one of the things that they talk about is how they get from one place to another and it reminds me a lot of the technology behind the railgun yeah because they say that you know they could let's just say start you're starting in philadelphia and you're at uh, some underground military let's just say raven rock you're at raven rock and um you're going to dulce and you're there in 20 minutes and they 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 say it's like it's like this this it just like shoots you there and it just makes me feel like the railgun technology could it be something like that? Now I know I'm probably talking like r- Chinese to you and stuff, but no, uh, I, no, I, 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 I absolutely believe that. I mean, I've, I've delved into, you know, like I said, uh, being, being a writer as I am, I research a lot of the stuff mm-hmm. myself and everything when I'm looking at it. So yeah, I that 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 is a definite possibility. I mean, electromagnetic rail. That's they use that for 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 the high speed trains and things yeah. in Japan. So yeah, it's it's de- all of that's possible. The technology is there. It's just getting to use it and how to use it. Yeah. is is where you have Without to turning into a pancake. Yeah. Exactly. Holy crap. Can yeah. you imagine like I mean, <laughs> imagine the speed and force your body would be under to go from one end of the country to another in 20 minutes. That's like it's insane. Like I, I think you you'd come out of that looking like a a yolk, an egg yolk. It's probably the same force as when you're launching because I've launched off an, uh, off of the deck of a carrier. But when you're doing it, you're sitting with your back to the front of the plane, and you grab your straps and brace yourself back because that that lurch, that launch, does that to you. But it would probably be something like that, I but imagine. for a longer period of time <laughs> than just that short twenty ten seconds that it takes you to yeah. launch off the deck of a carrier. Yeah. I, I, I'm fascinated by the the deep underground military bases uh, and the stories that come out from people. Um, but yeah, I, when we're done recording, I'll show you. I'll show you Raven Rock on Google. It, it's but pretty I mean cool. that, that's a fact because we've had those the since uh, since 
forever. Yeah. I mean, there's always been, I mean, especially from World War II and on into the Cold War, we've had those secret installations where nobody could, I mean, we, we all know that the, the, the stealth bomber and the, and the stealth fighter yeah. all came out of, you know, secret military installations in New Mexico. Yeah. yeah we know that it, <laughs> because there's pictures of them. Yeah. So we yeah. know there, we know those places are out there. It's, it, it's just that, what are they doing now? That's the question. Sure. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of Bob Lazar. Uh, do you know who Bob Lazar is? Afraid I don't. Uh, he, he came out back in, uh, I think it was the eighties and he said he worked in, in area S4, which is part of area 51. Mm. And on these, but actually this drawing right here on a documentary he did, that's a craft that he said he worked on and, uh, he signed it for me, but, um, oh, wow. he said there, I think he, if I remember correctly, he said there were like nine different crafts and they said, he said they all looked completely different. And one of the interesting things about what he said back then is he said that, uh, they, they worked with anti-gravity in the sense that these crafts would almost like eliminate the gravity in front of the craft and it would fall into a, a into like a gravity less space. And that's how it like propelled itself forward, but like huh. very rapidly, extremely fast. And he said in order to do that, these things would stand up almost vertically. And uh, then when we see the videos that were coming out over the last couple of years, a Tic Tac UFO, that's kind of what you see yeah. in, in this and how it's acting. It kind of really kind of gives him a lot of, you know, more credit as to his story from back in the eighties. But, um, it, it's just, it's very interesting. Those kind of things to me and, you know, sky and sea are some of the most mysterious things about, uh, what we do in our military. And now we're talking about space force. Holy crap. What do you think about space force, man? I mean, well, I mean, it, it's a logical next step because we, we know that's where, where things are headed. I mean, again, it, it, you have to think about the world as a whole and the geopolitical situation we're in. And do we want to be the ones up there first, or do we want to let somebody else do it first? Yeah. I mean, imagine China being first. Exactly. No, thanks. That, I mean, that's <laughs> that's the thing you have to think about. Is you know, yeah. you may, you can laugh at it all you want, but the fact is, is that it. You know, if we don't do it, somebody else will, and then yeah. then that's going to be a bigger threat. We're going to have to play catch up to, mm -hmm. and everything. We I we agree. don't want to do that. Yeah, I agree. And uh, who knows? Maybe maybe. Uh, Maybe they know something we don't know. Maybe there's other countries that are right, right on the verge of that kind of stuff. And that's why they're like, yo, we got to kick it into high gear here. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so let's shift gears a little bit. I want to hear about this house you guys lived in in Massachusetts, because I didn't know about this until Andrew Jean said, make sure you tell them about the house. Well, I was stationed um, in uh, 1995. I was sent to uh, assigned to the Naval Air Station, South Weymouth, Massachusetts. It's now been actually, the base has been closed and everything but i was stationed we were stationed there and um when we moved up there we had to find a place to live and with massachusetts one of the weird things is there's not a lot of apartment complexes like what you think of today okay and seeing a lot of a lot of people rented their houses or rented like half part of a house as an apartment or things like that so we was you know wife three kids we had to find somewhere so we found this we were looking around for about a week and we couldn't it was hard couldn't find anything that was approachable for what we were going to do and then we found this house it was uh, over on a uh, high street uh in in uh, east weymouth um and it was an older house i i don't know how old i'm i didn't really get into details without the owner um guy's name was john and so he was in the process of finishing, fixing up the house and everything. And it was, it was old, but it was like, you know, Hey, we can make this work, you know, uh, and everything we're, since we're going to be here, it was, the school was nearby. It was a good neighborhood. We figured, okay, this, this, this will work fine. So we, we rented the house and after we started moving in is when the weird thing started to happen. Um, we had one instance where, you know, I'm, I'm at work one day and I get a phone call from Georgine saying there's flies. All oh, this one window in the upstairs bedroom was just, just completely covered with flies. It's like, you know, and so she had to open the window and try to get them out as quick as possible. And, you know, and that, that incident happened. She, we called an exterminator. They looked, no, nope, they thought maybe we, a dead animal somewhere either in the attic or underneath. Nope. Nothing there. And that was weird enough. Yeah. But then she, she was actually taking courses uh from at that time 
And so she would stay, she would stay up late. When I would go to bed, she would stay up late and do her work. And she would always hear voices and hear sounds. And, and it was, and even, you know, the house, you just felt uneasy in. You really did. It was not, we were not, I don't think, I don't think uh, either one of us ever felt completely comfortable there mm. and everything. And we later then found out that the guy who was rented us house, the owner, um, his wife had come down with cancer and she was bedridden and, and she actually died in that house. And he was trying to finish fixing up. This was supposed to be their house together. So he was trying to finish fixing it up before she died and he never did. Hmm. And so, but we found out this after, cause she was like, my Georgine was cleaning out this one drawer and she found an article about <laughs> that was in there about really? her dying. And it was like, she died in this house. It's like, Oh my, <laughs> you know, it, it freaked us out <laughs> yeah. completely and everything. Uh, so it was just one of those weird experiences in, in this house, you know, that when you're just sitting there and you hear sounds and, you know, and she had mentioned this to you that there were times, you know, we, we, we were upstairs with the, our two girls, the bedrooms upstairs. There was another bedroom that was downstairs and that's where we had Zachary and we had the baby monitor. So we, he was right next to the kitchen. So you could go down where he wouldn't disturb other, the other kids or, or one of us, one of us would go down and take care of him if he would wake up in the night and we heard things and it got to the point of where, you know, when he would cry there, he'd say, okay, your turn to go. No, it's your turn because mm. neither one of us wanted to be downstairs See? by ourselves. <laughs> You know, even though my son was, you know, it made me sound like bad parenting, but I mean, it was just that kind of weird feeling. Yeah. And you see, mo most uh, parents, they're like, no, you go because they don't want to do the diaper. You're like, I don't want to deal with the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it came down to. Uh, the the one, I guess, I don't know if it's a saving grace or whatever it is with the end of that was that we actually found out that he, he was taking my, the rent money from me, but he wasn't paying the mortgage. And I got a call one day from the mortgage company saying, uh, we're, we're foreclosing on the house. You need to get out of there. Wow. <laughs> so I actually had to call to my base CO and we actually got then shifted and got moved on to base housing gotcha. uh, and everything. So we were kind is that of more preferable. Uh, in this case, yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I'd <laughs> say so. Definitely in this case, it was. It, it was it was a lot more preferable. Yeah, yeah. So wow. that was that, that was one of those weird in instances. Just you, you just never had an e an uh an easy feeling while we were living, and we lived there for about close to a year, almost a year. Mm. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Um, well, I'll tell you, the audience has heard me tell my grandfather's stories throughout the years on and off. I've played uh, recordings from him in the hospital when I recorded back in the day before I had podcasts, right? Yeah. Um, and it was just really interesting hearing Andrew Jean relay some of the stories that I've heard before. I'm just like, man, like it's, it's just confirmation for me that those experiences were, were legit. You know, like yeah. my dad tells me the stories, Andrew Jean did, Pappy told them to me, and it's always the same stories. And I'm just like, man, that's, um, it's crazy. It's crazy. The, the, um, the reality of this world. And the fact is we, we really don't have it all figured out. We think, no. we think we got a good handle on things, but this world is just really strange and we don't have it remotely figured out at all. I mean, the one thing I can relate to, uh, during my Navy career was, uh, one of the regular ports of call for, a a ship on the East coast is when you go do a Mediterranean cruise is Naples, Italy. Mm. And so from Naples, I would, they would offer tours to sailors of different sites and things around the area. So I always did Pompeii. I, I loved Pompeii. I loved visiting there because every time you went there, they had uncovered something new and everything about that. But when you, and you, when you walk around there and you can just feel the, the, the impact of that, of being in, in a place yeah. like that, that was once covered completely. And, and the people that just died, died like the way they did. It's just, it really hits you even more. So, I mean, I, I can't say, you know, I had any kind of experience there, but it just walking through there, you know, cause we only went during the day, but I can imagine what that, that place is like. And just every time you go, I'd go back there, you just get more and more of that feeling. Yeah. I can imagine. Uh, before we wrap this up, um, let me ask you a question. In the 23 years that you were in the Navy, did you ever have a close call that you felt like 
uh, this might be my time. Like, I mean, with all the different military exercises that we've, our governments have got been involved in desert mm -hmm. storm, things like that. Is there ever a time that like you, did you ever see battle or anything like that? That kind of made you feel like, ah, I, I love my family. I hope they know that. Um, yeah, a couple times. I mean, on, on the forestall, I, when I was on the forestall, we were, we were hip deep in the cold war. And, uh, the one time it went through the, um, went through the Suez Canal and everything. And then you go through the, uh, you pass down. And at that time, when you come around and when you're coming out of the Red Sea and coming into the North Arabian Sea, which is just outside of the Persian Gulf. Okay. You, know, when you come around there, that that's, that's called the Bab El Mendeb Straits. We used to nickname it the Barber Mandrell Straits. So it was, <laughs> it was a joke, you know, for everybody. <laughs> but when you're, pa but when we were passing through there, we actually had to be at general quarters because the Russians by that time were in Yemen. And so when you're passing through there and you've got Russian tanks sitting on the coastline, that's that's Ooh. that's a you know a bit of a of of, an, of a scary thought when you're yeah. at general quarters and you're doing and you're doing that. Um, the other time I had experience like that was at basically was after 9 11 because mm. um, I was deployed during when 9 11 happened and everything and we my, the enterprise was actually the first ship to launch strikes against Al Qaeda targets in Afghanistan. Okay, and so after we were relieved, we got extended about a month that was because we were at the end of our deployment at that time. So we extended about a month, and then we were relieved. When we were relieved, we had to go back through the Suez, of course, to come coming back home. This time going through the Suez, we we were basically at high security alert the whole time. You weren't even allowed. Usually when you go through the Suez, you're allowed on the outside of the ship and everything. You're allowed to look at the sites and see things, take pictures, you know, hey, I'm going through, you know, because with the Suez, you know, if you've seen the picture recently of that uh, cargo ship that was yes. stuck there, yep. you know, think of an aircraft carrier doing the same thing, but going, you know, you've got basically about 40 feet, 40, 50 feet on either side. Jeez. That tight. Uh, and, uh, that tight. Wow. And everything. I mean, you could basically jump off the ship into the water, swim over. You could be there in Egypt or, uh, uh, you know, wow. on the other side. So, you know, we're going through there and everything. And it's just tight security because you don't know if somebody was waiting while we were uh, passing through if something was going to happen to us. Wow. So that was just tight security. Did, did they ever get that, that ship out? I haven't. Yeah, they, I, they, they, they did. They, did. Fi they finally got it out. Gotcha. They finally, they finally had a, uh, got it maneuvered uh, out of position, I believe. It, it was, yeah. There was like cheering where they were, the other ships sure. were blowing because they got stuck because there was uh, ship stuck there. I can imagine what it was like. I know. Can, uh, can you imagine if it was if that happened? You guys were trying to pass through. Oh, we would have we would have gone the other way around the Africa, the Horn of Africa. We've had to go okay. around that way instead, which which I think a lot of ships got rerouted to doing that because of that. Hmm. The only time I, I I think it got to the point of in in fear of my life was I was on the USS George Washington. Um, we were deployed. Uh, it was late at night and general quarters sounded, didn't know what was going on. I went to my general quarter station, which was a uh, repair locker with firefighting team group locker, which was on the hangar deck and the main deck here. Uh, a fire had started uh, back aft on one of the fantails, which is on Sponson, excuse me, on the Sponson. Sponsons are part, basically like platforms that come out from the side of the ship. Okay. And we use it for storage, use it for, you know, gun areas, things like that, depending. This was an area which normally would be a, was a storage for what, uh, for fuel that was used for the tractors and other equipment that didn't, you know, non, you you know, more like this was like, this was basically uh, barrels of gasoline were stored there. Whew. Somebody went out there and decided to have a cigarette. What? What? In the <laughs> and oh, basically, a, a fire started. Yeah. The fire got to the point where it, it spread up the side of the ship. Jeez. It went in through ventilation. because And right there under there, there were ventilation shafts. And so it went into the ventilation. It started affecting birthing areas in the back. Started coming up over the flight deck. So, you know, this again was one of those, you think back to the forestall. When there's a fire at sea, mm -hmm. you have to fight that fire or you're going to die because there's nowhere to go. Yeah. You know, you, there's, you're, you're not at the pier and where you can just step off. No, you either, you're going to save the ship or you're going to be swimming. Yeah. 
So we were we were at general quarters for probably most from, from till about three in the morning. Okay, uh, almost almost eight hours at general quarters, and uh, we got the fire out. Everything got under control. You know, no lives lost. Thank God. Yeah. You know, so that but that was probably one of the scariest times I've I, I had at sea. I mean, I've done. I mean, like I said, you, you you go you get to general quarters when you're doing different different maneuvering too close to to the coast and things like that. I, you know, my time on the forest off, if you've ever think back to the eighties, Muammar Gaddafi in Libya, he had that yeah. line of death out there that if the Navy crosses it, you're going to be, we're going to attack you. Well, we crossed it and I was on the forest all and we crossed the line. I even have a patch on my one jacket says oh, really? I cross. Yeah. I have a patch says I crossed the line of death. Wow. Cause we did that. You know, that was the kind of thing uh, I've participated in, you know, uh, Cold War exercises where we were buzzed by Russian aircraft. Uh, my first deployment on the forestall, we were leaving. There was a Russian trawler waiting for us as we were pulling out, and you know, and everything. And he started following us. And captain came over the one MC and said, "We're going to go up to flank speed and put this sucker in our wake." And we did. Hey, <laughs> but but I mean, you know. A little Russian trawler with an with no no, <laughs> no way. So, but but I mean that that was about as intense as it got. Sometimes you know doing exercises like that and everything. But that fire was probably the the worst. Man, that's time. yeah, that's intense stuff, man. That's intense stuff. But uh, I want to I want to say thank you for coming on the show. I'm I'm happy to do it anytime. This is great. Yeah, and uh, let's tell the people again where they can get your books at. Uh, if you visit my uh, my website, author Mark Piggott, P I G G O T T at dot dot WordPress dot com, awesome. and the links are there to to buy my books. A lot of people wind up going to Amazon right away to purchase books. Is it yeah. there? Oh yeah, it's on Amazon. Okay, so. it is it is all over Amazon. Awesome, very cool. Well, thank you very much, sir, for being here. Thank you, I appreciate it, Tony. Well, that's the show, everybody. I really hope you enjoyed it. And if you did enjoy it, please share the show with your friends. I don't care where or how you share the show. Just share the show if you enjoyed it, because that's the best thing you can do to help this show grow. And go ahead and check out my Uncle Mark's books. They are on Amazon, and I did put the links in the description below so you have ease of access. So go ahead and check that out. And I hope you guys enjoy those books because the storyline is awesome. All right, guys, until next week, stay safe, take care, and remember, the truth will set you free, but first it'll piss you off. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Confessionals on YouTube. If you like what you heard, hit the subscribe button, hit the share button, and hit the like button. That would be a great help to me. And if you want more of The Confessionals on a weekly basis, every Thursday I come out with a special show just for members on my website. So if you want to check that out, go to theconfessionalspodcast.com, hit the join button, and become a member today. And every Thursday, you'll get a new show, and you can binge on previous shows, which there's almost a 100 of them. So if you love the show, go ahead and check it out. But thank you very much for being here on YouTube and checking out the channel. Bye.